Philippians, I know for some of us in the room, Philippians is our favorite epistle. Um, I could see why. I mean, you could probably pick any of these to be your favorites, um, or not favor one over any of the others, because the Lord does not show any favoritism. Just kidding. Um, uh, but the, 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 right, the prison letter here can be grouped with Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians. Again, around 60 AD. Again, rather remarkable that Paul was as productive as he was towards the end of his life. Uh, Roman prisons were not pleasant places to be in at all. Um, and they kept them, apparently, qu these places for quite a long time. In general, prisons at the, at, in, the Rome, in the empire were not places where you were sentenced for a you know, number of years due to a crime like we do nowadays. Uh, you usually ended up because you were being detained or being transferred, re ready to be tried, kind of how we treat jails nowadays, right? Jails are all under one-year sentences, and you're being held there in order to be tried uh, elsewhere. All of their jails and or prisons were like that at the time, or you would end up there if there was severe debt-related matters. But all that, you were not there for that long because it was always on the way or in between trials against you. And then the sentences were much more severe at times than just simply sitting in a rat feces infested dark cave. All right. Um, right, this is what remains of Philippi. Not necessarily a small city um, at all, but it's so an important one. And it becomes clear from the very beginning that Paul, yes, is a prisoner. And again, he begins with these words of gratitude and praise, something that I think now has been drilled into our heads and we understand quite well. Look at verse 3. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray. Wow. And it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. Sometimes that's been translated because I have, right, you have me in your heart. Um, I suppose in the Greek it can go either way. You are all my partners, in, uh, my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. Right there, the statement being affection one is that I, I have you in my guts. I mean, I, when I think of you, I feel it viscerally. I feel it inside of me. In fact, kind of interesting, the rhetoric here is something that appeared very often in love letters of that period of time. Right? It's when it's like, oh, my, I mean, I have you deep inside of me. Um, you are not just little numbers to me. You are not just a couple of people who happen to be members of these churches. I feel the affection of Christ when I think of you. However that feels, I want it. I don't know if I have it. Okay? But it's a remarkable statement. This is my prayer that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. That statement is an important one. Right? We often think that love and knowledge are two distinct areas or activities of the human. Right? That our human faculties we have are love, which is primarily emotional, right? Uh, or affective, and our knowledge is something in the order of the intellect, right? Here, Paul makes a very interesting statement of, I suppose, what would maybe count as some sort of Christian epistemology, right? Or Christ-centered epistemology, Christ's way of knowing. You know because you love, right? This kind of, in many ways, strikes the heart of kind of Western kind of thinking or the, you know, the cogito ergo sum, uh, I think, therefore I am, of Descartes. I know that I'm a thinking thing. Even though I can doubt the existence of everything around me, I know at least that I'm thinking these doubts. So therefore, I know at least that I'm a brain on a stick. Um, or brain with legs. Right? I think this can be very, very powerfully challenged by this statement. I'm loved, therefore I am. I'm loved. I'm known by God. No one, however horrendous or great, their life has been up to a certain point, they're loved, right? And therefore, you exist, right? And he, here, he takes his cue. If you love, you will know things, and you will gain insight, right? I mean, isn't it true? You defend the things you love, but you can't love anything unless you learn about it, right? And I think this is part of what Paul is after. He says, he thanks them over and over again and says, I just want you to grow in love. Why? 
you walk around being sappy, kissing each other all the time? Maybe so. But more so than anything else, it's really a matter of then you'll know. You'll have insight. You'll have wisdom. Love will grant that to you. Not just reading stuff. It's because you actually love one another. And one of the things I think is most powerful about this is that, yes, the good news is repeated over and over again. Look at all the references to the gospel. Look at all the references to joy. And there in, in number two, the good news and joy. What a thing to write about when you're in prison. Something that we've probably heard often, right, when we've heard sermons on the, right, the epistle to the Philippians. How can a man be in prison and be this joyful? And repeatedly mentioned, huangelion, mentioned this good news. He says, from prison, I'll still be a herald of how good stuff is with God and what good things he is doing in the world, right? And again, this is not some sort of surface, I'll just put a, you know, a smile on my face, Ned Flanders type of you know, Simpsons Christianity. Hey, everything's all right. You know, um, not, not that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's more than anything. It's, I know that despite how bad things get, God will act. That's what joy is. Despite how bad and brutal and horrendous things can get, we are still accepted in a sense, right? We're still loved. God still wants to do something. That is the basis of joy, right? And this is what Christ's prisoner here is, wants to make clear to all of them, right? And he says, so considering that you all know I'm in prison and word is spreading about me being in prison, I want to make something here, verse 27, let your public behavior be worthy of the gospel of the Messiah. So when you are out and about, don't shy away from being publicly clear about who you are. Because, of course, they knew that once you say, hey, are you a follower of that Messiah faith? Yes. We're the Messianic people. Oh, isn't one of you leaders in prison? Again? Well, how many times has it been now? Right? And he's in the prison. I mean, he's in Rome. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, you messed up, I guess. But not me. I'm law-abiding. And he knows oh, that, that can form some rivalries, that can form some shame, there can be some serious fear about how to respond to that situation. He says, whatever happens, if you're going to declare your allegiance to Christ in Philippi, understand, he says, he wants to understand, it has to be worthy of this good news. You can't shy away from the fact that it's supposed to be good news to people. Right? Isn't that true? Somehow, and I know I've presented God in such a way that is not good news. It's more than anything really, really bad news. And I work my way to the good news. But it's always the idea that the, 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 from the beginning to end, it's supposed to be good news. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, it pierces the soul. And yes, it's supposed to call someone to a different life. But that is good. <laughs> if the angle and the attitude is always one of, let me keep on motivating you through fear, mm, it's hard to build something on that. I suppose I could prompt things forward in certain di directions in a right way, but not necessarily something that maybe would, right, would, would issue in a life of thanksgiving. So there's high stakes here. You have to understand, right, yes, some charges have been brought to him. He knows that his life is on the line, and he wants to make it clear to them, if my life is on the line, I just want to leave these words with you. Please, please live in koinonia, right? Live in unity with one another, right? Everyone here knows that I'm a prisoner. Everyone here knows that... I write that, that I may not survive this at all, but I want all of you, as it says in verse 27 and on through, right into the Philippians hymn in 2.1, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united and agreeing with each other. How many times have we seen this now in the prison epistles that we've read, right? To counteract the forces that drive us apart, Shame, fear, rivalry, competitiveness. Right? He says, please, please undo all that stuff. Not just because I'm in prison. You know what I mean? But on top of that, it's because otherwise the world will not see good news. They'll see bad news. They'll see rivalries. That's probably one of the most, unfortunately, damning things about the history of Christianity is, right, is that the example of many churches has shown people these people do not live good news. Right? They live bad news, they live divisive news, they, they just do not right, display, the, exhibit that kind of Christ-likeness. Right? And that's, of course, the call for us as well. Koinonia is a word that's not just, hey, have some fellowship and hug one another, but 
directly and mutually support one another as family members. You are together as brothers and sisters. Right? That's what he wants us to do. The Christians now, as it says, would not join these pagan festivals. They would not celebrate any of these things. And knowing now that they, it could get you in prison, you start realizing and, and backing, right, and, and backtracking, have I done the right thing here? Right? How many times have we questioned our own faith? We know how many people in our own congregations are questioning their own faith. This is a script, right? These are sets of scriptures that I think do meet that challenge well. Paul himself was in prison. I don't know how many times he doubted this stuff, but he most certainly gave it to God. Amen. He took himself to God. And he knew, right, he knew that these people were thinking, if Paul is in prison, people do see us as a threat, what does that mean to us? What are we going to do in this right, well-established Roman colony? People come through there, right, it, had, it has its own praetorian guard, right, it has some higher-ranking folks. These were intimidating people. And considering, of course, that, you know, everything from the marble statues, right, to the reliefs in front of the temples all shows the victory of Rome in this or that different agenda, it could show you that you have to know how to stand on your faith, right? Stand on your own two feet and be strong. So we know what the prayer of the prisoner is, love each other more and more. We know, right, that we've heard probably many, many sermons on the Christ hymn in Philippians. Yes, very likely it seems to me a song. The one thing that I want to highlight about this, okay, um, and then I'll sort of we'll put a fly here to the end, about the Christ hymn is that it actually represents a very powerful principle that you see repeated several times in Paul. And it probably can be summarized best with, even though I have X, I do, right? Even though I have this right, right? We know this in other passages, right? In Corinthians, right? 9, right? He says, even though I have right as an apostle to carry a believing wife, right? To, in a sense, demand or expect payment from you or expect such and such support, I did not write, it leads to the famous, to the Jew I became a Jew. He says, even though I have this right, I don't exercise any of them. Even though I have X, I don't do blank, instead I do Z. That's how Philippians runs. Even though Christ is the full stature and representation of God, he does not exercise any of those things in a way that's an advantage to him, but instead serves and gives himself to God. Does that make sense? By that logic, that... Though he was in the form of God, that's the X, he empties himself by taking the form of a slave. Even though he has X, he, right, he does Y, and right, he doesn't do what, it, it, is, what could, it could actually bring to him. He doesn't exploit it, but instead gives himself over as a slave. Paul, I think, repeatedly lived in his ministry in such a way as to express that principle. Even though I could actually take advantage of all of the rights that I have, I do this instead. Because I don't want to place any obstacles in the way of Christ showing up in me. Let's ask ourselves that question. Are there certain privileges and rights that we do? To, and may, we actually have a good reason to enjoy them. But if we were to give them up, what, in what way would it show Christ? In what way would it manifest Christ? That's the Philippians hymn in a nutshell, and it shows up. It's up to you to find where Paul takes up that kind of position. And he says, this is one of the reasons why you can mature in Christ. You can find deeper and deeper levels of what it is to be a follower of Christ if I follow his own path of starting up top, but then lowering myself and then letting God exalt. Right? Letting God lift you up. Right? That's the pattern right, of that, right, that parabola right, of Christ himself starting up, but humbling himself. And then it says, and then God exalted him to the name that is above every name. Okay? If you kind of get here to the right, the, the hymn and the call is a matter of working out your salvation collectively as a group. How are we going to work out our salvation? We know, right, you've probably heard sermons. I know that, you know, that, that Ed has preached about this before. We can at times take many of the appeals in Philippians only in an individualistic fashion. Um, when in fact, right, the call is, how are you all going to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? I mean, considering, of course, that the appeal is from the leading up to the Philippians hymn is all about unity. Right. Right? You see how deeply relational this thing is, as we've heard many, many, many times over and over again. Right? But in the end, right, we want to, as I have up here now, we want to get to the heart of Paul right, towards the end of this letter. Right? Probably one of the things that we enjoy most about this letter 
of course, is Philippians 3. For a while, this was my favorite passage, uh, especially as a young Christian, even though I have these advantages. Notice again how he's almost repeating the very same thing that he expressed in the Philippians hymn, but here it comes again. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am the people of Israel. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee. In other words, I have all these credentials that do actually bring right, quite a bit of advantages to my life. They gain me safe passage in a number of places. They give me recognition in certain quarters. He says, you know what? None of that stuff matters to me. What is it that we need to let aside and drop? Right? That no longer has to be for us the hat that we, right, the, the, the kind of the, right, the, what we hang our hat on to give us a sense of significance. Right? But Brian Hinkle and I were talking the other day about, you know, reaching and reaching out to folks in, you know, in some places of American suburbia. Right? That we, we accrue a whole lot of stuff, credentials and possessions. And I, you know, and I, I quoted to him, you know, the work of one researcher that puts it, there is a pervasive shame-based fear of being ordinary. Right? A deep shame-based fear of being ordinary. Wow. I always have to distinguish myself from this other person. I drive this hyper-competitiveness into my own children. Right? I mean, I mean, teaching in a college for 11 years, it's remarkable how many freshmen, right, first-year students I've met who are already burnt out by the time that they're a first-year student because they are burnt out during the high school years from having to do this or that amount of courses and this or that amount of sports. By the time they get there, they're already hating college. I was wondering if they thought maybe they hate this college. But they just hate it, period. They've actually learned to hate life. Part of it is because their parents were always jumping. You can't be like the other kids. You can't be ordinary. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do this. And it's deeply, right, and it works a very, very deep shame and it, usually at times resentment. Right? But here, right, Paul says, your allegiance, our citizenship is in heaven. Right? Which is not when you die, you'll just go up there in the sky somewhere. He says, what God will secure for us and is holding for us in a place that is not here, right? That is not working according to this logic. It's working according to a logic of the heavens, right? Of God's place. That's being protected. That's secure. It's not given to all of this mess. That's where allegiance to that, right? So as we think about this, we think, yes, we can hear his words to stand firm, but we want to hear some other words here, right? That God will care for his people, right? that God will do this work. You know, let's hear a word now. It'll take us back to Ephesians. It'll give us some inspiration about the type of people of God that we'll be together. I'll give you Matt Fisk. Oh hey, everybody. Appreciate the chance to be able to speak and uh, give a little bit of exhortation. Thanks for preaching to y'all. You guys still awake? Yeah. Might be preaching to a dead crowd and everything. Amen. I'm supposed to introduce myself to the camera. My name is Matt Fisk, and my wife Katie and I serve in the Hampton Roads Church in the campus ministry there, just in case you don't know us. Let's turn back to Ephesians. And Gabe brought us through um, some of the main themes of the book of Ephesians, the grand inclusion and reconciliation of everything. That everything was supposed to be brought back together. What I'm going to talk about is why in the world does that matter to us? I don't know how many of you guys have woken up at any point in time in the last five years and gone, you know what's really going to bother me today? The Jew-Gentile controversy. <laughs> Raise your hand if, if you're Jewish. For like the four of us in here. Great, awesome. But that's not exactly what's bothering most of us. But this is a huge theme throughout the entire New Testament. If we don't understand why God put this in here, we're going to miss an incredible part of God's character. I got a, my, my little thing, it's really a tale of three temples. It's starting in Ephesians chapter 2, and we know that, that, you know, the first chapter that Paul is just waxing loquastically. I can use big words because it's MTA. He is just spilling it all about how awesome it is to be in Jesus. And then in verse 13, he says, And you also, which would be all y'all Gentiles, y'all are included in that. In chapter 2, he talks about all of us, Jew, Gentile, were by very nature objects of wrath. We are the last people that you would ever pick to represent God. And yet, because of his grace and his power, he says, you're my A-team. 
Not because you're awesome, but because I'm awesome. Not me, God. You know what I'm saying. That's right, because I'm awesome. You're welcome. But in chapter 2, verse 14, we'll Come pick on, this man. up, and it says, He himself what? is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jews and Gentiles, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We'll stop there real quick. First thing he says, he talks about the dividing wall of hostility has been destroyed. Now back in Jerusalem, there was the temple, which is where God lived. And in the middle of that was called the Holy of Holies. And nobody was allowed to go in there except for the high priest one day of the year. That's where God lived. Then a, a little bit further out, there were uh, different courts that you were able to come close to God based on who you were. There was a court that was just for the men, the Jewish men, by the way, and it said the men can come in here. There's a court for the women that said the women can come in here, but no further. And on the very outside, there was one of the court of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles say, you could come this far, but don't you come closer. Because if you come any closer, we're going to kill you. You take your life into your own hands. Now, it could be that Paul is talking about that physical wall. There was an actual physical wall. But beyond that, there was a greater wall in the hearts of the Israel, Israelites and the Jewish people. That even if there wasn't a physical wall, there was a social and a cultural wall of superiority that the Jewish people said, we don't like y'all. We are God's superior chosen people. Can you imagine that just for a second? Can you imagine that if we were at church? They say, hey, the visitors, oh, you're visiting with us? You can come and sit in the back row. And all the women, you can only come to the 20th row back here. And then all the brothers, you can be a little closer, but the front three rows, if you're not on staff, forget about it. Can you imagine that? That was that temple. Not because God just liked people better, but there was a matter of graded holiness. That unless you were this holy, you cannot ride the ride. You can only come close to God if you are this holy. And what God says is that I'm destroying that wall. It's gone. There's no more graded holiness ever again. And we pick up again in verse 19. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We are right here. Look around here. We are the temple. We are God's temple now. Now, if you skip down to chapter 3, verse 6, he tells us why he does that. This mystery, stop right here for a second. If you were from Ephesus and you heard this Greek word, mysterion, there would have been this idea, this concept that would have shot through your mind. It would have become so clear to what Paul meant. The mysterion was secret knowledge of cultic worship. In Ephesus, there is one of the, uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. And to worship Artemis, there would have been cultic worshipers that had secret knowledge. That if only, if you really wanted to worship Artemis, you'd have to, and a lot of gods, they had the same thing. There was secret knowledge. Not everybody got to know, but secret knowledge. It'd be like kind of joining a frat. You know, when you have to go through initiation, and then they tell you what the letters mean, and it's always disappointing. Or like the Coca-Cola recipe. 
Secret knowledge. Not for everyone. But check this out. The mysterion, the secret knowledge of God. What does it say? The secret knowledge of God, the mystery, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Meaning that the secret knowledge of God is that it's not a secret. In fact, the secret knowledge of God is getting shouted from the rooftops. And the secret knowledge is that it's not secret for only a few people. It's for everyone. The favor of God is not for morally superior people. It's not for intellectually superior people or financially superior people. It's not for the Jews. It's for everyone. It's not for black people. It's not for white people. It's not for Asian people. It's not for Latino people. It's not for athletic people. It's not for anybody that's just more attractive or more influential. It's for everyone that has a heartbeat. And that is whose God has chosen to be his temple. One more thing. And then I'm actually going to stop preaching because I'm just teaching you right now. Give me a second. In verse 8 says, although I am less than, uh, than all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make it plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, mysterion, for which ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent, so why he did this, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom or the multifaceted wisdom of God should be made known, not just to the world, but check this out, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Hold up for just one quick second here. You realize that by being brought together, even in this room right now, by being the temple of God, that people in heaven are learning about God through you. Angels are learning about the character of God through you and what happens in this room. But also Satan learns about the character of God through what's happening in this room. That's incredible. The spirit world is learning. I don't even know what's going on up there. But something's happening. And it's because of what's going on right here. Because you are the temple of God. We no longer have to go to a temple to worship this God that we serve is coming for you, and we are his temple. And we are revealing to a lost world, but also somehow a confused spiritual realm, too, about who God truly is. We are revealing that to all of creation. But here's the question. What are we actually revealing to this world and to the heavenly realms? This is an example of what I was talking about yesterday. The indicative precedes the imperative. Regardless of what you do right now, if you are in Christ, you are God's temple. Amen. But what are you doing with that? Sometimes our calling exceeds our behavior. And we represent God, but a lot of times we don't actually represent God. Do you know what I'm saying to you? And if we don't live the life that God is calling us to live as his temple, the impact that we have on this world resembles what Gandhi said about Christianity. He said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. The next three chapters of Ephesians calls us to some of these great points that we need to have as God's mobile temple. In chapter 4, it talks all about unity. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, and we are supposed to make every effort to keep the unity through the bonds of peace. You know, through the kingdom, there's different approaches that we have to going about bringing this mystery to the world. There's different culture that we have in different ministries in different places. But sometimes we can feel like, well, I like our ministry, but, I, you know, here's what I heard about that church, about what's going on there. I really appreciate what, what the leadership does in this church or that church or my church or my ministry. And it can kind of become a, kind of a one up thing. That's great. You know, they're, they're really spiritual, but you know what? They're not really a family. We're all one big family. What are we doing? 
This is the family of God. That over time, and guys, this is so important because we're all so young. Like most of us here, like for if you're for MTA, the future of the kingdom will be held together or fall apart based on how unified we fight to be with each other. Do you understand that? That the older guys that are awesome and amazing and we're learning at their feet are getting a little older. And they were all back in Boston or L.A. or somewhere at one point in time. But we don't all necessarily all have that. So we got to fight to be connected through unity in every corner of the kingdom. So we can't be comparing ministry stats or ministry approaches. We're family. We are the temple of God. Despite our backgrounds, despite our different races, we need to show that the world that we are together, no matter, because brought together through the blood and the grace of God. Amen? Amen. The second part, chapter 5, we all know about chapter 5. Not even a hint of sexual morality or impurity or of any kind of greed. We know that. Because those things are improper for God's holy people, right? That as God's holy temple, that God's grace needs to show to this world and to the heavenly realms that God's grace transcends the desires of our flesh. We are the revealed secret of God to the world. Does that secret listen to Kanye West? Does that secret spend its evenings looking at pornography? Does that secret of God always up on the newest styles and trends and have the sweetest, freshest kicks? Does that secret know every word to Drake's new album more than their body? Is that the secret? No, the secret is that the grace of God transcends all of that and we don't have to be enslaved to what the world says we have to be enslaved to. Not the lusts of our flesh, not what this world is trying to press us into our mold, its mold, but it is greater. I just got to keep going because there's so much. In chapter 6, and at the end of chapter 5, going into 6, it talks about families. Do you realize your families are also meant to be little mobile temples showing God's great power? If you're married, your marriage is actually supposed to be a sign to the world and the heavenly realms not just of true love. I love my wife, but that's not what it's actually supposed to be. It's supposed to be an illustration, a picture of the mystery of Christ and his church. Families, parents, and children. Parents, we're supposed to love our children, or your children, because I don't have children. I definitely don't have your children either. You're supposed to be a picture of God's love towards children, and we as children are supposed to respect our parents the way that we respect God, and that's another model. Slaves, it talks about, you're supposed to obey your masters. So for us, there's no slavery here, but sometimes you can feel like your job. You serve your job in a way that pleases God to show your coworkers and your boss how you treat God as well. And same thing with your classes. You show your professors and your classmates how you respect and honor God and how you work at that so that every person everywhere from every corner of the earth can see who God truly is brought together by his temple. Does that make sense? But as soon as we do that, we are under attack. Satan wants to dilute that picture because he's up there and he already realizes he's lost the fight with God, but he knows he can win the fight with God's people. So we must stand firm. I'm going to close out with this. Ephesians 6, y'all still with me? Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, temple of God. The mystery revealed. God's people. Be strong in yourself. No. Be strong in your willpower. Be strong in your masculinity. Be strong in who you are. No, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not 
against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. You stand firm in unity. You stand firm in purity. You stand firm in holiness. We stand firm in our marriages and in our families, in our jobs and in our classes. We stand firm in the truth. We stand firm in the face of demonic opposition. We stand firm to make known the glorious mystery of God's race, grace for all people. And if this seems impossible to do, remember this. Ephesians 3, verse 20 now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Is that you going to keep those? Great.